OK. So I'm going to kick off uh, the series of talks on quasi-elastic scattering. Particularly, these are the experimental measurements of quasi-elastic, neutrino quasi-elastic scattering that we'll cover in the session um, starting before lunch. So I thought I would start this off by quickly defining what we mean by quasi-elastic scattering. I think with this audience, I don't need to go to belabor this too much. But of course, in electron scattering, uh, quasi-elastic scattering has been measured over many decades, and it's well-defined. This is an example of uh, how that is measured in the electron nucleus scattering case. You can measure inclusive electron scattering and measure, in particular, the energy lost by the electron in the interaction. And that's what this is a plot of. You can see clearly at low energy loss, there's a peak coming from quasi-elastic scattering. And as you move up higher in energy loss, you also have contributions from pion production. You can excite very various resonances. And you also have a continuum from deep elastic scattering. So you can make such a plot in electron scattering and measure inclusive scattering and look for the quasi-elastic peak at low energy transfers. Or you can also measure various exclusive states looking for a single nucleon knockout or um, two nucleon knockout um, in that case. What's special about electron scattering is that the uh, uh, electron flux and the beam energy are precisely known. So you know the electron energy coming in is typically monochromatic. And uh, as a result, the kinematics are well defined. The energy and momentum that are transferred to the nucleus can be precisely measured. So what's interesting is to compare and contrast this situation to the same case with neutrino scattering. In that case, there are some similarities, but there are also some differences. In, electron, in neutrino scattering, you can also <coughs> measure the inclusive cross-section and look for events with uh, low nu. Here, again, diff difference in terminology. But we uh, classify events with low hadronic activity, or for example, events with no pions in the final state is one way of measuring a somewhat more inclusive quasi-elastic scattering state. But you can also look for various exclusive final states. Some experiments looked for the muon and the proton emitted in the final state, or can also measure um, multinucleon final states. In contrast to the electron scattering case, one important uh, issue with neutrino scattering is that the beam energy is not known, and the beam is not monochromatic. Instead, you're looking at a spectrum of neutrino energies. And this is, this is a very stark contrast to the electron scattering case. So as a result, one must infer the neutrino energy, the beam energy, rather than having it well known and precisely measured coming in. Instead of with neutrinos, you must infer that energy from the kinematics of the final state particles that are produced in the interaction. And one typically does that by either summing up the amount of lepton and hadronic energy in the interaction, or one can invoke, invoke quasi-elastic kinematics and determine the incoming neutrino energy strictly from the outgoing lepton's energy and angular distribution. In addition, uh, what's different for neutrino scattering is you also have an additional contribution from the axial vector current, which you also need to include to describe the interaction mechanism. As a result, you have a very similar picture in the neutrino case, but we typically think in terms of neutrino energy rather than in terms of energy loss. But here I've tried to preserve the same color scheme. You have a quasi-elastic peak, but you also have at higher energies contaminations from resonance production and deep elastic scattering. So the picture is kind of the same, though we talk about different kinematics between the two cases. And it's certainly true that in neutrino scattering, we have poor kinematic specification, again, because we do not know the incoming beam energy or uh, its flux that is precise as we do with electron scattering. So this is just to compare and contrast the case of electron nucleus scattering and neutrino scattering. And if you want to read more about the electron case, I refer you to an excellent review article that was written by Benhard Day and Sick uh, several years ago. It's a, it's a rather long paper, but it certainly uh, is a nice review of the situation in electron scattering that I highly recommend uh, that you read. So this workshop is, is uh, and this session is uh, devoted to discussing neutrino quasi-elastic scattering. So having gone through what that is on the last slide, let me mention why this process is so important in neutrino scattering. It's, it's important because it's important for neutrino oscillation experiments. It's uh, the biggest piece of the cross-section at energies below about a GeV. So it typically gives the largest contribution to signal samples in many oscillation experiments that are currently um, running. It's also a nice sample to use because one can infer the neutrino energy, which is a very important kinematic when looking for neutrino oscillations, uh, 
One can infer the neutrino energy strictly from the outgoing lepton kinematics if you invoke the quasi-elastic scattering conditions. And that's particularly amenable to certain experiments, for example, if they can't see the outgoing hadron in the interaction. So if you can just get the neutrino energy from the lepton, that's very advantageous. It's also once thought of as the simplest neutrino process to calculate. For free scattering, it's typically thought of as a process with a single nucle uh, knockout nucleon. So you have a muon and a proton in the final state. But we now know, of course, that when you scatter off a nucleus, the situation is much more complex, and the underlying nuclear physics are much more complicated. But to first order, we've typically thought of this as a simple process, historically, um, and have described this scattering process with impulse approximation-based calculations. Namely, we assume that the nucleon you're scattering from is independent from other nucleons, nucleons in the nucleus, and that is a situation that's quickly and rapidly changing. While this process is very important for neutrino oscillation experiments, it's also been heavily studied since the 1970s, and it was one of the first neutrino interactions uh, ever measured. So I thought I'd flash up a little bit of the history of neutrino quasi-elastic scattering measurements. Uh, Hugh, Jerry, and myself wrote a review article a couple years ago where we tried to compile all the various historical measurements of neutrino quasi-elastic scattering. And this table shows the attributes of those various measurements. So here's all the different experiments that have published results on quasi-elastic scattering over time. Uh, their mean energy, what neutrino target they employed, what type of detector they used, and what year they produced their results and what year their experiment ran. So above this line are all historical measurements. You can see they date back as early as the 1960s, and most of them used bubble chambers filled with deuterium to do their measurements. Below the line are the modern measurements. As you can see, they uh, covered this interaction over a variety of different energies. They also employed a variety of different detectors and uh, exploring these differences uh, will be a major goal of this session to really gain some better understanding of what it is that we're all measuring now compared to what we measured um, historically with this process. Historically, as I mentioned, most of the early measurements, and this being studied now almost over 40 years ago, most of the early measurements used bubble chambers filled with deuterium. That target was chosen uh, because it was recognized that, that was less influenced by nuclear effects. And the advantage in this case with these historical measurements using bubble chambers filled with deuterium is that you can observe uh, quasi-elastic scattering through the emission of a final state muon, the proton, and they could also observe the spectator proton from the interaction. And this has several advantages. One in that is that you can strictly enforce the quasi-elastic kinematics, seeing this three-track final state. So the event selection is much more robust. And in the end, these experiments typically had very impressive quasi-elastic purities, 97 to 99% pure quasi-elastic. Again, with this enforcement that you see that all these three tracks in the final state, the lepton, the scattered nucleon, and the spectator nucleon from the interaction. So starting from that type of quasi-elastic event selection, which was very clear, and you could enforce the quasi-elastic kinematics, experiments uh, historically set out to measure the free nucleon form factor. So that was the primary aim of these experiments back in the day, and this shows a collection of Q-squared distributions from those experiments, all using deuterium as their target. The reason why there was so much interest in measuring the nucleon form factor was that this was recognized as a very important ingredient in the analysis of neutral currents. Back then, all the interest was in detecting, analyzing, and observing neutral current interactions. So one wanted to carefully scrutinize the charge current version of this interaction, again, to get a handle on the axial vector contribution to this interaction that you couldn't get otherwise from electron scattering. So this shows the caliber of data back at that time, which helped set the axial vector form factor, and in particular, measurements of the axial mass appearing in that form factor, which from the deuterium-based measurements was extracted to be about 1 GeV. This next summary table shows what uh, these various experiments measured in practice in looking at quasi-elastic events. So again, here are the various different experiments, how they selected their quasi-elastic events, which is very important, the number of events they observed, what type of purities they obtained, how they determined their flux. Again, this is absolutely critical if you're measuring a neutrino cross-section is having a good handle on your incoming neutrino flux. 
And this shows check marks in terms of what values these, these experiments actually measured. Up on top, again, are the historical measurements. And as we go down to the bottom, these are the more modern measurements of quasi-elastic scattering. So in looking at this table, you can notice a couple of trends. One is that the quasi-elastic event selection can vary from experiment to experiment. Here with the deuterium-based measurements, a lot of these employed three-track analyses, again, looking for the muon, the final state proton, and the spectator proton. But that can vary between looking for one, two, and three tracks in the analysis. And we'll come back to that later. You can also notice as a second trend that we have much larger event samples available in modern experiments, orders of magnitude larger event samples, which allows us to study this interaction in more detail. And also, you can see that the purities have typically um, degraded a bit. They're a bit lower in the modern experiments. And that has, in large part, to do with the fact that we're using heavier nuclear targets in the interaction, so we have larger backgrounds from other processes. I should mention that this table was written in 2011. There are also new results from MINERVA, which we'll hear about this afternoon, which also will populate this table. But again, historically, the main focus was on getting some information on the axial vector form factor, so a lot of experiments um, early experiments and modern experiments trying to extract the axial mass from these data samples. There was also a lot of focus on measuring the cross-section as a function of energy. And now in modern day experiments, we're trying to push the envelope and measure, for example, double differential cross-sections in terms of final state particle kinematics. And we'll talk about that in reference to the mini boon results later. So I mentioned that a lot of interest was in measuring the axial mass and the axial vector form factor. But in addition, many experiments measured the quasi-elastic cross-section as a function of energy. And this has the advantage, in one sense, that you can compare measurements from different experiments all in one plot. And this shows such a plot that will, um, it's, a, it's a new plot that will be in uh, the PDG in the upcoming edition next year, made by my postdoc, Anna Shoecraft. This shows the compilation of all that data shown in the table on the previous slide now plotted as their reported cross-sections as a function of energy. In black are all the neutrino measurements, and in red are all the anti-neutrino measurements, with two curves just from a, an example um, prediction. It's actually a free nucleon prediction. And you can see a couple of things. I heard that, whew, in the back. I don't know who did that. You can see the situation here. We thought that by measuring this seemingly simple process in the modern era, you would think that all these data points in the modern measurements would all fall neatly on these lines with much compressed error bars, and we'd just be verifying this process. But instead, something quite interesting has emerged and that we're starting to appreciate the importance and relevance of nuclear effects. And the situation surely is not under the type of control that we're going to need for future oscillation experiments. Plotting all the data on this type of plot also calls into question, um, what is it that we're actually all measuring? Are we all measuring really the same thing? We have different detectors, different selection, different nuclear targets. What is it that we're each calling quasi-elastic? We call it quasi-elastic so we can put it on this plot, but are we really measuring all the same thing? In addition, it's also recognized that while historically a lot of the focus was on measuring things like the axial mass appearing in the axial vector form factor, or measuring this cross-section as a function of the inferred neutrino energy, um, it was recognized that this was done historically, but now we realize that these are very model-dependent quantities, especially when you're scattering off nuclear targets, as we are in the modern era. So now the preference has swung towards trying to get back to basics in terms of understanding the nuclear effects involved in these interactions and to start reporting differential cross-sections in terms of things we actually physically observe initially in the experiment. For example, measuring cross-sections in terms of the final state muon and proton in these interactions. So while historically much of the focus has been on things like the axial mass and this cross-section as a function of energy, in appreciation of the nuclear effects involved and the complexities of this interaction in neutrino scattering, we're hinging towards trying to go back to just measuring the final state particle kinematics to try and get some footing in terms of this interaction. So that is, in fact, what turns out to be the main goal of this session that we're planning to hold uh, before lunch. As I've just noted, there are multiple modern experimental measurements of what we call neutrino quasi-elastic scattering. As a statement of fact, they all use targets now heavier than deuterium, so they can't anchor the interaction in this three-track type of signature event. What's nice is that the um, new measurements have much higher statistics, so we can measure this process with, what, with much higher precision. They also are coupled with 
much more well-known incoming neutrino beams, which is certainly an advantage. But as a disadvantage, uh, modern measurements all use nuclear targets to increase our event statistics. So hence, they bring along with them additional complications that we need to confront head on. So the goal um, of today is to leave this first session of the workshop hopefully with a crisp understanding of what each experiment measures and defines as quasi-elastic scattering. So the purpose of this session before lunch is to try and give you a sense of what is it that each experiment is calling neutrino quasi-elastic scattering. Because as you've seen, um, the detectors differ, the selection differs, so it'd be good to, get, um, to scrutinize this and get a better understanding of what it is that we're calling quasi-elastic scattering. So this is the lineup of talks we have envisioned. After my talk, Roberto Petty will discuss the quasi-elastic measurements at NOMAD. Kendall will talk about the same at Saibun and T2K. We'll have a coffee break and then transition to all the experiments that are running on the NUMI line at Fermilab. Minos and Nova covered by Nate. Argonut discussed by Arnella. And Gabe, assuming his flight gets in on time, will discuss Minerva. Um, and then uh, with, a, with a thrust on what it is that we've measured, and then before we go to lunch, Debbie will give us a nice view looking forward of, OK, now you've seen what we've all measured. What do we need in addition to this to move forward to get into this precision era of neutrino oscillation measurements? And of course, answering this question of what we need to know moving forward um, can depend a lot about what target you're using and what detector you're using. She's going to give us some forward looking vision um, before we go to lunch. So the goals of these experimental talks, so we'll go through <coughs> each of the experiments is to understand what are the experimental results telling us, to what extent are the different experiments observing the same or different interactions, and to what extent are the measurements in agreement or are they in tension. So that's the hope that we arise at that clear understanding uh, before we go to lunch. So to help, is there a question? Say it again? Each of the experiments in this session will talk about the flux. And yep. it'd be interesting to know how much you think you know, uncertainties in the flux or that could have affected the steering and the continued to get towards primary class for the steering measurement. Sure. Um, we tried to go into that in some detail in our summary. If you go back to this slide, certainly for the older deuterium measurements, we tried to look back through all of their references in the literature and itemize how it is they determine their neutrino flux. And you can see two things. A lot of experiments uh, just dead reckon their neutrino flux using whatever hadro production measurements they had at the time. But there are a few that used the quasi-elastic scattering sample itself to establish their flux normalization. And this is one of the circularities of some of these historical measurements is that they used the quasi-elastic sample to establish their neutrino flux and then turned around later and measured a cross section. So that's problematic. And so that's something we tried to avoid specifically in more modern measurements. And you know, uh, you know, the reason for this is at the time, there were factors of two, three, four differences in flux predictions. And I think people felt that they knew the neutrino deuterium quasi-elastic cross-section much better a priori than they did the neutrino flux. So they would use this process to establish the flux. But then unfortunately, years later, they'd also then use that same flux to then measure a cross-section. So you have to be careful with some of those historical results in trusting those normalizations, because there's a little bit of circularity in it. That's right. In most of the axial mass measurements were extracted from shape fits, though some experiments also extracted it from normal, normalized fits. But they are very careful to point that out in their papers. But most of these, these measurements come from shape fits, which would be um, independent of that normalization as set by that event sample. Okay, thanks. Yep. How soon is the free nucleon? Once you have the two figures, you can normalize it as two figures with zero. That's right, using beta decay. Right. So in a sense, that's how it's done. You, you measure the Q square distribution, you normalize it to Q squared to be zero, and you get zero in the future. So when you integrate it, you actually have a cross section. Right. So you can normalize to Q squared of zero, but there are some extra complications there in that there's some efficiencies involved. For the bubble chamber experiments, a Q squared of zero, those are events going very forward through the detector. And those are typically events that had poor efficiency. Because remember, they're using cameras. 
to detect the neutrino interactions. And the camera, the Q squared of zero, those very forward muons, were going straight towards the camera. So if you look back to those old papers, the efficiencies, the uncertainty in those efficiencies were also larger at low Q squared. So yes, you could invoke beta decay to help set the normalization, but you also were plagued by however, how well you detected those very forward events in a bubble chamber. So there's complexities. Yeah, Lorik. This is just the introductory part. Could I just make a talk? In this yes, please. So you said, what do we measure? When you say QE, that's a well taken question. One word is clear that has to appear there, namely pion. I mean, there is no way experimentally to distinguish a pure QE process from one where the pion was produced and the pion gets reabsorbed afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So there's always a contamination of pion. There's no way to get rid of that experimentally. You mean you mean pi zero? Yeah, no, no, I mean real pi. Pi and absorption. You produce a pi and the pi gets reabsorbed. There's just and one neutron you coming out that you do. It looks mm -hmm. like QE oh, and then at the end, you know. You don't mean these things. There is no way. No. And that's about 20% of the total that's right. system. So that's even at mini boom. Yep. So that's not really. And Ulrich makes an excellent so point. One always has to talk about QE and pi together. Yeah, Ulrich makes an excellent point. And that's exactly why these purities are worse for modern experiments, because there is this contribution from pion absorption, which is about 20 to 30% of these event samples, compared to you know, 97, 99% purities you'd get in deuterium with that selection. And this is largely coming from the pion absorption contributions, is why these purities are lower. OK, good. So I discussed the lineup for uh, the rest of the sessions and the kind of questions that we want to try and address. So to help um, facilitate this, we asked each of the experiments the same four questions that they're going to answer. One is, how do you select quasi-elastic events? How do you define a quasi-elastic scattering interaction? I know that many of you have heard these experimental talks uh, throughout time and at various conferences. We want to you know, really roll up our sleeves and go up in depth. What is it that you're really measuring? Second is, how do you determine your neutrino flux? Again, having uh, a good knowledge of your incoming neutrino beam is absolutely essential for making these cross-section measurements. Third is, what is your primary, or what are your primary quasi-elastic measurements, and what do you find most important about your own data? Four, looking forward, what additional quasi-elastic measurements do you have planned for the future that could help um, shed further light on some of the issues that we're seeing in current data? Plus, in addition to answering these four questions, each experiment will present a summary table so that we can have this sort of detailed information at our fingertips for some of the discussion. And I think the type of direct comparison has been absent um, in previous conferences. So we'll have um, available to us these, these detailed tables of how each measurement differs from each other. So to help kick things off before we start the experimental talks, um, I want you to consider Mini Boon as a quick example. Um, it's one experiment that's measured neutrino quasi-elastic scattering. So to set uh, the course of these talks, I'll just go over Mini Boonin's example, and then we'll turn it over to the other speakers to talk about the experimental measurements elsewhere. As many of you know, uh, Mini Boon is a Trankoff detector. So we're measuring neutrino interactions on mineral oil. So it's largely a carbon-based target. Um, because it is a Trankoff detector, we rely on ring imaging, um, Trankoff ring imaging for both the event reconstruction and particle ID. So this sets it apart from some of the other measurements. It's not a fine-grained tracking detector. It's a Trankoff detector. What's nice about this apparatus is that it is a spherically symmetric detector, as you can see from this picture. And as a result of this having this 4 pi coverage and the fact that Miniboon operated in a lower energy beam means that we have full angular coverage of the final state muons created in these interactions. So we can equally well measure very forward-going muons as we can backward-going muons. Again, because of the fact that we have this very spherically symmetric detector. Our detector doesn't care whether a muon is going forward 90 degrees or backwards. And that is, tends to be quite nice in terms of um, exposing and measuring these nuclear effects. In addition, because of the detector, um, we use particle decays for the quasi-elastic event identification. So and specifically, our quasi-elastic requirement is that for, these sam for this sample, the event must be charged current, meaning it has a well-reconstructed muon in the final state. And we require that there be one and only one Michel electron in the event. And this is the sole net of the quasi-elastic event selection in Miniboon. You require a muon and one and only one decay electron. What's nice about this, in contrast to some of the tracking detectors, is there's no you know, pion or proton 
thresholds, tracking thresholds involved in this, 